The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna Zylik. I am with ICF, and we are the vendor working on behalf of the sponsors of Energize Connecticut to bring these passive house and all electric homes trainings to all of you. So thanks for joining us today. These trainings are at no cost, thanks to the sponsors of Energize Connecticut and are part of a partnership with Connecticut Passive House and Build Green Connecticut. Today's trainings will be recorded and will be available online afterwards. A quick reminder that as part of this training and workforce development initiative, we are offering a 75% cost reimbursement for individuals pursuing either FIAS or PHI professional accreditation. So this includes the cost of the training and the exam. And once you become certified, we'll work with you to process the 75% cost reimbursement. So if you have any questions on that process, please do not hesitate to contact us. Um, in addition to the no cost educational training series and the professional accreditation reimbursements, the sponsors Energize Connecticut also offer robust incentives for builders and developers who choose to go all electric with their residential buildings or pursue passive house certification and multifamily projects with five or more units. So the passive house incentive design for Energize Connecticut is shown here and includes pre-construction incentives for feasibility studies and energy modeling and post-construction incentives for full passive house certification. The all electric incentive is for both single family and multifamily buildings. It offers two levels of eligibility with specific design and performance requirements associated for each and has incentives amounts ranging from $1,500 per unit for multifamily up to $10,000 for single family homes. So our goal is for everyone involved in the construction of residential buildings in the state of Connecticut to be aware of these incentives. If you are interested in learning more, please visit our website or um, contact us directly at the address on yeah this slide. And just um, for today's presentation, for any questions, please feel free to use the chat function or the question function throughout, and I will relay them over to Aaron Gunderson, today's speaker. So with that, I will turn it over to Aaron. All right. Thank you so much, Anna. Thanks for organizing today's event. And thank you to everyone here for attending. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, sorry, got to get the slides going here, but this is Pass House 201. Uh, we put on uh, a session last week, Pass House 101, and I know many of you were, were there, uh, so happy to continue that. Uh, I know some of you are, are new joining us here uh, for just the 201. Um, hopefully you have a little bit of, of background already um, and some of the details we covered last week. Um, I'm going to do a very, very short review only, and, and we're going to dive into some of, the, some of the details we did not cover last time, so we're going to get into a lot more around design and construction details of how we actually achieve Passive House today around building them below. We'll talk a little bit about mechanical systems, share some lessons learned and so on. And like Anna said, please ask questions if you have them. Um, I'm happy to, to address them as part of today's session. It's meant to, to answer those questions. So for those that weren't here last week, I am Aaron Gunnarsson. I'm the uh, director of Passive House Massachusetts. Um, so coming to you from uh, uh, one state away, but I'm happy to talk with Connecticut. And I do want to give a, a lot of thanks to Connecticut Passive House who I've worked with in the past on events, a great group there. So if you're looking for some, you know, local source of Passive House, definitely go to them. Um, so what did we learn last time? For those that were here, if you, you remember what we learned about Passive House, two really important things. First off, not all houses are passive. Or sorry, not, not all Passive Houses are houses. <laughs> Um, not, not quite the right term, uh, and not all passive houses are passive. Uh, so what we learned last time is passive house is a bad name. That was uh, one of the main takeaways, but that's the name we're stuck with. Uh, really what we're talking about are really, really efficient buildings. And the reality is a passive house can be any building. Um, so here's kind of a little refresher on what passive house is and what it means. So. Let's see here. I need to get something out of my window. All right, there we go. So Passive House is a third-party building verification program with two different 
certification bodies out there that provide the certification. So there's CS and there's PHI. We'll talk a little bit more about them today as well. Um, but these are the groups that set of the standards and the standards are energy performance metrics and air tightness metrics, but they set those standards um, and you, you hit them. So how did buildings perform? We dived a lot, a, a lot into details last week. I shared a lot of examples from, from data that we have on how buildings are performing and how they're costing. We're not gonna go through all that again, again this week, uh, but to summarize, we're, we're seeing heating and heating loads, uh, and I should say space conditioning loads. This really means heating and cooling loads being reduced by 90% or more compared to a typical building. We're also seeing overall energy demand. So when you take those heating and cooling loads and add in um, hot water, plug loads, appliance loads, everything in, in a building, we're, we're reducing that by 60% or more. And the data we showed last week, you, you saw many, many projects that are hitting that easily. Uh, so that is a, a real metric, not just a lofty goal. Um, and we're also seeing a significant improvement in indoor air quality and occupancy comfort. We have less data to show specific numbers on this, but we know it's a reality of these projects. And it's becoming a larger and larger reason why we're seeing uh, clients and developers choose Passive House. It's because just it's a better place to live, better place to work uh, for commercial projects. Um, it's, it's hard to downplay this one. Air, indoor air quality is, is becoming a much, much larger driver of of passive house and why we're seeing it grow. And as I've kind of already mentioned, passive house can be any building, any size, any project, residential projects, townhouses, you know, multifamily buildings, commercial buildings, schools, municipal buildings, any type of building can be a passive house. These are examples in Massachusetts. Um, the building on the right that you're seeing, that's a Winthrop Center Tower that's now um, finished and occupied in downtown Boston and is home to the largest square footage of certified pass house office space in the world. So right here in New England, we have the largest certified office space. Um, this is something I asked right at the beginning of last week's presentation. So those folks already know the answer here. Um, I think most of you can guess based on how I've been presenting this. Um, all these buildings are passive houses. So we have again single family homes. This is showing you a wide variety of different buildings. We're seeing a, a dormitory. We're also seeing a, um, a Subaru car dealership there in the center. So keep that in mind when we're talking about this. A lot of what we're gonna focus on is residential buildings and honestly, multifamily buildings is that's where the real growth is in Passive House, especially in the New England area. But the reality is Passive House can be any type of project. So backing up now to the organizations who, who do this. So I said at the beginning, there's two of them, BS and the Passive House Institute. So these are the two groups that create and manage the Passive House standards. Pass House Massachusetts doesn't do this. Connecticut Passive House doesn't do this. Um, we support these organizations by providing training and resources and being a hub of, of sort of local knowledge. Um, but these are the two groups that actually define the standard um, and certify projects. They both have their own sets of metrics and criteria for what a Pass House is. But you, as somebody going through this process, can choose either one of these to certify your project. The goals are going to be a little bit different, um, but when you compare this to a typical project, um, they're very, very similar. Um, so I should also um, mention that these two organizations are also the ones who provide that accreditation for, for professionals. So when Anna mentioned the, that significant reimbursement for going through a certification training, uh, you would go through a certification training put on by one of these groups. Um, Connecticut Passive House or Passive House Massachusetts might help sponsor it, but these are the groups who are really putting it on. And that would be something like the Certified Passive House Consultant Training or the Certified Passive House Designer Training or so on. So that comes from these groups as well. What is the Passive House metrics? What are they based on? So the, the main category is performance criteria. And we're looking at heating and cooling demand, whole building air tightness, and source energy demand. I mentioned all three of these already, but it's just good to know that if you kind of conceptualize passive house and think about it in your head, you can just sort of bucket everything into those categories. And passive house, just like any other sort of building performance standard has other things that it looks at just to ensure that the project is, is being built well, constructed well. So there's other criteria out there, but really performance criteria are the ones that set this apart from other building standards. So, I'm gonna take a moment here to dive into the metrics themselves. I'm gonna look at some actual numbers. So before I, I'm doing this, I just wanna clarify that these are examples. 
Uh, these, this is going to be some data from a national project, but this won't necessarily be the numbers that your project will have to hit. So just keep that in mind. This is just for us to, to look at and get an example of. Um, so what we're looking at here is we're comparing pass cost metrics between PS and PHI, both so you're getting an understanding of what metrics are and, and how they vary between the two organizations. We're looking at, um, these are the numbers that a, um, a single uh, story, single story, uh, small office building in Massachusetts had to hit based in, in Newton, Massachusetts. And they went under the FIAS standard. So the numbers they actually fit are that, that first column there labeled FIAS. Uh, but if they had cho chosen the PHI standard, these are the numbers they would have hit under the PHI platform. So you can see the, the metrics break down a little bit more into annual heating demand. Um, and then peak heating demand or peak heating load, and then those same metrics for cooling, so annual cooling demand and peak cooling load, and then those source energy metrics. So what you're seeing under annual heating, if you just look at the top, the annual heating requirement was 5.3 kPPUs per square foot. Uh, so this was a small project, um, can't remember exactly, maybe 3,000 square feet. So if we're looking at 3,000 square feet of a project, that meant that their annual heating demand had to be, um, what would that be? That would be about, you know, 15, 1500 KBTUs total or lower. Um, and that's per year of annual demand. Compare that to PHI, the metric would have been about 4.8. So very, very similar, especially when you think about an old, um, you know, existing building we have here in New England that, you know, even if you're on a, a fish high efficiency natural gas boiler, you're probably still having an annual heating demand well above 50 kBTUs. So dropping down to 5.3, pretty significant reduction. Um, cooling demand, you can see there, their metrics for cooling demand were lower, 2.9. And that's one of the biggest differences between FIAS and, and PHI, is that FIAS uses what we consider to be climate specific metrics. So no matter where that project is, or wherever that project is, you're gonna be using local climate data to help you figure out those annual heating and annual cooling metrics. Um, so if this project was built in Texas, you most likely would have had a annual, annual heating metric around 2.9 and an annual cooling metric up higher around that 5.3 because of the difference between a cooling climate and a heating climate. The PHI, the numbers are about the same. You can see their annual heating numbers are 4.8, annual cooling numbers 4.8. It's the same. Their metrics are more universal. So no matter where that project is, it's going to be the same metrics. And again, I say this is this is general. Both standards, you know, have their own calculations for how this this exact number is figured out. And when you first, you know, enroll your project and go through the very first steps of, of you know, conceptualizing your passive house, these are going to be this is going to be figured out. You're going to know what you have to do. The bottom number that's your source energy. This this row is looking at your overall energy. So first off. Just to clarify, this is source energy. So for those of you out there that are familiar with the difference between site energy and source energy, we're looking at source energy. If that doesn't mean anything to you, that's that's all right. But for those that that it does mean something to you, just that's what we care about is source energy demand. Um, with PHI, there's one number. It doesn't really matter if you're looking at a commercial project or a residential project. You're looking at about 60 kilowatt hours per square meter is what you're allocated for overall energy demand. When it comes to um, the FIAS metric, they actually separate it based on commercial and residential projects. Residential projects, including multifamily residential projects, actually have a per person metric that they have to hit rather than that square footage metric. Uh, so that is an, another difference between FIAS and PHI is that FIAS looks at that sort of on a per person metric. And they have their own calculations for you know, how you estimate the number of people occupying a, a multifamily building, for example. Um, it's all clear within their standard, but, but they do have that there. Um, I put the links here at the bottom of this, and but these are easily accessible data from, from their website and from everything. In fact, this next slide, I'm going to show you the, the calculator FIAS uses. Uh, before you even enroll in your project, you just want to play around with it a little bit. This is, this is front and center on their website. Uh, you can use this whether you're doing a commercial project or residential project, but it helps you figure out what these numbers will be for your project. Um, PHI doesn't have one of these as readily available, but that's okay because, as I mentioned, the metrics are more universal. So you can pretty much imagine you're going to hit that. You're going to have that 4.8 kBT goal, for example, uh, for heating, or that 60 kilowatt uh, per kilowatt hour per square meter goal for for source energy. 
no matter what project you're looking at. With the TS project, go into this, use this calculator, just pick your building type, the location, so it can pull your local climate data, uh, the size of the project and the density. Um, this is for a, a residential project. If you were to select uh, a commercial project on your building type, you know, the, the size and density uh, inputs might be a little bit different, but for a residential project, it's looking for size and density. And then at the bottom, you're getting your output. You're getting your output for space conditioning and your output for source energy. So this specific project, the residential project of a, you know, around 3,750 square feet um, with a condition floor area of 2,000 square feet, one, one dwelling unit. So the whole building is just one dwelling unit, it's not split up, uh, but there's four bedrooms within it. Um, so basically a single family home in Boston would have an annual heating demand of 5.2. That's what this is telling you here. And they would be allocated 3,725 kilowatts of source energy per person, so per, per person in that, in that building. So that's sort of how you would calculate these metrics and what we're talking about when we look at fast loss metrics. All of this is driven by advanced energy modeling throughout the entire phase of the project, from very early feasibility study phase through design and even through construction and verification, you're gonna be using an energy model to accurately predict uh, how much energy this project is, is using. Um, so there's two platforms out there, two softwares, Woofy uh, and THPT. Generally speaking, if you're doing a FIAS project, you're going to use the Woofy software. And if you're doing a PHI project, you're going to use the PHPP software. Both of them, uh, you know, they're, they're a little bit, a little bit different, but they, they're effectively the, the same thing. They're looking at the same thing, data, the same metrics, they're putting the same stuff in there. They're just sort of slightly different software based on the, on the separate certification platforms. But what you're doing with these is you're modeling your heating and cooling demand, your peak load, your total energy demand, all those key metrics that we want to hit, you're modeling that in here. You're also modeling hydrothermal interactions between indoor air, and building envelope, uh, you're looking at thermal bridging performance and thermal heat transfer, um, you're calculating performance level of different components. So everything, every type of wall insulation, uh, windows, uh, everything that you put in this project or you're entering in here, uh, Depending on the depending on the you know the product the item you're using, the software might already have data for that product. Um, if it's a newer product that uh, they don't have in here, you have to sort of you'll get some product information sheet from the supplier and put some information in here. But you're but this is going to have some detailed information on what you're using so that can accurately uh, measure everything. It's also going to take into take into account climate data. It's going to take into account um, sunlight and sun. Uh, sunlight for the project throughout the whole year, estimated, you know, sunshine through the windows. Um, and of course, the mechanical equipment, the sizing, the type, all, all this sort of stuff, as well as internal and external heat gain sources. So internal heat gain, uh, just to kind of give an example, that includes, that includes people, uh, the people in the project are heat sources, and this, this model accounts for that. So there's lots of, lots of granular data that goes into this to really accurately model how this building is going to perform. The other metric, um, if you remember sort of the key ones I mentioned, heating, cooling, demand, source energy, and then air tightness. This is the air tightness standard. Um, so this is, this is a really important metric. And for, uh, for project teams, this is the key one that you should be working on. The, the energy modeling and doing the energy modeling early is really going to help you figure out if your project is going to hit the, the standard or not. And, and once you do, you're going to kind of, you know, mess around with your design, mess around with the amount of insulation you're using and things and really get um, get these numbers numbers hit. But the air tightness really requires um, it requires a strategy and um, attention to it throughout the entire process, um, all the way up into your the final construction uh, phase. Unlike the, the other metrics, this one is not modeled. This is measured uh, through the use of blow door tests. So at the final final stage, when, when the building is fully constructed, you will run a whole building floor door test, and you will have to hit this number, uh, 0.6 ACH50. Um, this is uh, officially what the PHI standard uses. Uh, FIAS uh, defines it a little differently, but it comes out to a, a, about the same thing. So if you just want a quick conceptualization in your mind of what you have to hit, 0.6 ACH50. Um, for those who, you know, this number is not, again, kind of like the source energy for site energy, if you're not familiar with with air tightness and things like air changes per hour, that's okay. You'll, you have plenty of opportunities to learn about that. 
Uh, but for those who are familiar, they're probably, this will jump out to you, I'm sure, of, of how big of a, a leap this is going from the traditional energy code requirements of about three all the way down to 0. 0.6. Those are really important metrics. So quick review of the benefits of Passive House. Uh, we did talk about some of this stuff last week, um, but you know, why do we do this? All this, all these metrics, all this attention to detail that I just went into, why are we actually trying to do that? Uh, we're, well, here are the benefits we're getting. Financial benefits, we're seeing reduced utility costs, lower utility bills. Um, we're also seeing more predictable utility costs. It tends to be about the same month to month. It makes it easier for, you know, the tenants or the owners to, to budget and predict how much they're going to pay. We're also seeing reduced equipment maintenance costs. Um, so make less maintenance costs for the mechanical equipment. We're also seeing less maintenance costs just for the building overall. Less things are failing in these projects, less uh, problems with you know, any water intrusion or other things that might cause uh, um, you to be called back to a project. Um, and just simply longer lasting constructions. These, these buildings are built to last. Um, health and comfort benefits, as I mentioned at the beginning, improved indoor air quality cannot be, cannot be said enough. This is a really, really important factor for why people are choosing these projects. Um, I think, you know, all the sort of the first movers, the people who really jumped on Passive House in the beginning were probably motivated by the, the bottom ones, reducing carbon emissions, making a more climate resilient building, and maybe the top one reducing some of the costs as well. Uh, but what we're seeing now is that people who are kind of coming to Passive House at this point, a lot of them are being driven by these health and comfort benefits. Um, reduce air drafts, more comfortable building. Uh, along with that, we're seeing, say, for example, more stable temperatures, whether, you know, you're standing next to the window of your house or kind of at the interior house or on the first floor compared to the third floor, there's going to be a stable temperature throughout. Um, so that goes a lot to comfort and how occupants feel in the building. And then on the environmental benefits, obviously, reduce carbon emissions, more climate resilient building. Um, one of the things we talked about last week in terms of what climate resilience means is, for example, um, if there's a power outage or extreme weather conditions outside your building um, and you're in case in the middle of winter and your equipment that produces heat isn't running, well, your building, your passive house building, because of that envelope and that air tightness is going to hold that heating for a lot longer and allow you to withstand the duration of that power outage in a comfortable building. That's one of the things we mean by resiliency. And it's a platform for electrification and net zero. So I mentioned this last week as well, but just to clarify, these projects are not um, by default all electric or net zero. Passive House doesn't require either one. However, Passive House projects are a really good platform to achieve those things. Um, so a lot of Passive Houses are net zero or all all electric just because it, this is just a great opportunity to do that. So those are sort of the benefits, the reason we're doing it. I'm going to do a quick review now of sort of the, the features of Pass House buildings. You can think of these as like the design construction features of these buildings, how we're actually constructing to meet this. And then what we're going to do is actually spend a lot of time today diving into these details and talking a lot more about them. Uh, but in general, you can divide these into your building envelope and then your mechanical systems. So your building envelope are all the things that well, these are things that make a building really passive. This is, you know, the, the way that we control thermal uh, uh, thermal heat and, therm and cooling in a, in a building in passive ways uh, by creating a really continuous thermal uh, barrier around the building, so continuous insulation and making a therm making a, sorry, continuous air barrier around the building so we control how air moves. And we're mitigating thermal bridges, using better windows and doors, optimizing solar heat. All these things we'll get into a little bit. Uh, well, actually, I should clarify, we're going to spend more of today on the thermal insulation, airtight building, and, and thermal bridge mitigation. And then we're going to talk a lot about mechanical systems. So we won't talk much today actually about windows and doors or solar heat gain for that matter, but I'll mention, mention them as they kind of fit into the other topics. So the building envelope is kind of the key idea of passive, and it's really the, the focus, especially the design stage. Um, but mechanical systems are in many ways equally, equally important. These are these are what makes a passive building not passive, but they're what provides the heating, cooling, and critically, what provides our ventilation. Um, so we're going to dive into that towards a little later in today's session. We'll talk about examples of ventilation systems. We'll talk a little bit about how they're designed and size and, and things on those lines. Um, but just kind of a quick way to think about it is the, the ventilation system is our, is our respiratory system. It's the lungs of the building is how we make it breathe. So definitely important. And again, ask questions if you have them as they come up. So, 
Before we get into those specific things on building envelope, we're going to talk about some general design strategies. So these are none of none of these things under this heading of general design strategies are in any way um, requirements of the PASOS standard. They're just concepts to you know achieve PASOS easier. They're just things to keep in mind from the early conceptual and design stages for how you can make it easier for your project to achieve pass the house by kind of keeping in the mind general concepts. So the first is sort of massing and form, um, the shape of the building in other words. So the more complicated the form, um, the more challenging it is going to be achieve your air tightness and thermal bridging reduction requirements. So yeah, a square, a square building or a rectangle building is kind of boring, but it's going to be the easiest way to achieve passive house. You don't have to make it a square building. You can do other things to it, but the more that you introduce um, various different you know, shapes and, and, and things sticking out of the building and all these different uh, complications. Um, just keep in mind that's going to make it a little bit more harder. You're going to have more transitions between your air barrier that you're going to have to pay attention to. You're going to have more uh, possibilities of thermal bridging that you're going to have to pay attention to. Um, so you can make it as complicated as you like, but it just means there's going to be more details for you to pay attention to. And the earlier you're aware of that, and the earlier you look at those details, the less impact this, this will have on you. Um, building orientation and siting. So um, the size and sort of shape of the building is one thing, but how you locate that building on the site is going to have a, a big impact as well. Um, solar heat gain is a, a large part of, of the heat source for these projects. So having a, a sort of a long face of that building facing towards the south so it can get a lot of sunlight. Having that side um, of the building have a, a lot of windows to let that sun in during the winter. Um, also having shading features on that side of the building though, so you can find ways to block that sun during the summer months and so you don't overheat projects. Um, and also thinking about how trees and other buildings are going to influence this on your site. Um, but again, another thing to take and just consider when you have the very early opportunity uh, to place that building and orientate it on, on the site. Density. Uh, so this is another one of these general concepts. The more heat sources inside means you have more heat gain, which means you need less, say, insulation and less, you know, thermal barriers around the project, or you might need a, a smaller mechanical equipment to produce heat. Um, so the more dense the building is, the easier these other things can be. Um, this is just an example of two projects in Massachusetts, uh, the distillery and, and Finch Cambridge, just two multifamily projects. Um, they were designed pretty similarly, but and they both use mineral wool as continuous insulation. The distillery used three inches of mineral wool, Finch used two inches. Um, Finch was more dense. There are lots of other reasons going into, you know, why uh, they may have had one inch less of insulation, but density was a factor. And just consider it on your projects. And then glazing percentage and placement. So windows, where you're putting windows, how many windows you're having. I talked a little bit about this on terms of solar orientation. Um, but windows are helpful for bringing in sunlight, but they're also going to be the weakest place in your wall. No matter how high efficient windows you get, how many panes of glass you have, they're going to be weaker than the, the general wall itself is. So the more and more you have, the weaker you're, you're making that wall in terms of the thermal barrier. In general, again, this is completely general. Don't think of this as a requirement. This is just a, kind of a guideline. A more than 25% glazing to wall ratio is kind of the where you might have more problems. And again, more problems doesn't mean you can't achieve passive house. Uh, it just means you're going to have more, more things to pay attention to, more details to care about. You might have to have uh, more insulation in the other sections of your walls or think about windows that have um, uh, better thermal breaks in them. There, there's things you're going to have to keep in mind when you kind of have more windows. Um, and of course, um, keep in mind shading features as well is going to be a big concept. And I should be, clarify, these type of things are part of the energy model. Um, you're going to go in that energy model, you're going to enter all the window details, you're going to enter where you have shading, it's going to help you figure all this out. This is Finch Cambridge again that we're looking at. The side of the building that's, you know, looks like the front of the building that's facing towards the interior of our slide here, that side is facing south. And you can see every window has a little shade on top of it. Um, but you can see the, the other side of the building, which would be uh, facing east, that doesn't actually have shades on any of the windows. And how they figured that out is partially through their energy model. They did some different different things in the model and tried to figure out, you know, how, what impact solar heat would have. And they realized that for for summer uh, cooling purposes, they wanted more shade on the south side so they didn't get as much direct sun 
uh, coming in, but on the east side, it wasn't as critical when they give you the shady features. So those are the general sort of guidelines, things you should keep in mind. Now we're going to dive into some more specifics. This is going to be the building envelope. So we're going to talk about our thermal barrier and we're going to talk about our airtight barrier. Um, after sort of this section, um, which will also include thermal bridging um, and a little bit about water control, then we'll get on to our mechanical equipment and talk a little bit about that. So again, ask questions if you have them, happy to, to answer as, as things come up here, and we'll also spend time at the end to, to ask them. So let's start with uh, what a building envelope does. It provides a thermal barrier around the entire building. Um, so that includes things like dense pack, frame cavity insulation, continuous insulation around the outside of the frame, and also focuses on a reduction of thermal bridging or places within that frame that, um, well, are not insulation and where heat can transfer easily. Um, and then the building envelope provides an airtight barrier, so thermal barrier, and then it provides an airtight barrier around the building, which we do through a continuous air barrier system, fully taped, laundry penetration sealed, eliminating every little air gap. Um, and let's dive into more of those. What you're seeing here um, on the right is the distillery. This is a multifamily building in Boston, and um, you can't see the, the cavity insulation, but they, this was a uh, two by eight uh, wood studs, dense pack, I believe they used uh, cellulose. Actually, I should say that they used either dense pack cellulose or fiberglass um, in this project, but they dense pack the cavities. On top of that, they put a zip system sheeting, which is the gray material you see on the top. Zip system is a sheeting material and when installed properly, a dedicated air barrier. So they use that as their air barrier system. And you can see the black tape and everything that's helping to seal it really tight. On top of that, they put that brown material, which is mineral wool. Uh, as I mentioned in that previous slide, they used three inches of mineral wool to form the continuous air barrier, or sorry, the continuous insulation layer. So between the, the zip system, and the mineral wool, and then that dense pack cavity insulation, they created their thermal barrier and their airtight envelope. Before we get to those things, we have to talk a little bit about advanced framing. This is something you might not think about often when you think about past health projects, but one of the, the key ways we can reduce thermal bridging and create more space for insulation is just by doing better framing methods. So simply put, we're trying to reduce the impact of thermal bridges from our wall studs and our headers and our other wood in, in projects. Um, I'm mentioning wood here, but this applies to metal frame projects just as much as it does to wood frame projects. Uh, focus areas, we're looking at stud spacing, so spacing studs out a little bit more, generally 24 inches on center versus 16 inches on center. Doing that's going to mean you get to use fewer um, studs in the project overall. Fewer studs equals fewer thermal bridges, and you're going to have more space for insulation. Um, corners of your building, headers, these are other kind of key areas where key advanced framing techniques matter. So this, I'm just going to show you the example about corners. So this is sort of typical, you know, framing that you'll see on a lot of projects. Um, what you'll notice here are, are two problems. Um, one is um, those wood studs are creating a lot of thermal bridges. If you look kind of where that where the word drywall is, um, you know, and that's the inside of the of a room. Heat is just going to transfer right through those wood studs and has multiple paths to follow uh, as it goes out of the building. The other problem that creates is it creates that little dead space in the middle there in the corner where you're not going to be able to get insulation. So you're going to have a spot in that wall in that corner that's not insulated and has a lot of thermal bridges. That's, uh, that is something that pass valves just cannot have at all. So there's a couple of ways to go about this, a couple of solutions. Um, advanced option one and advanced option two. These are just two options that I see in the field. Doesn't mean these are the only things, but they're just two ways to address this. The first one is um, by just kind of pivoting how you do one of the studs. That uh, solves one of the problems as it allows us a space to put insulation in uh, without having a dead space, but it doesn't solve the thermal bridging at all. Uh, the second option helps solve the thermal bridging. Uh, we're instead of having a wood stud that we're kind of nailing one of the pieces of drywall, you're using drywall clips. And the drywall clips um, help reduce some of the thermal bridging. You're, you know, you're eliminating the stud, you're creating more room for insulation. So if you just a couple examples of how you can apply different framing techniques to reduce thermal bridging. Uh, this is just showing you a header, um, but what we want with headers are just insulated headers. I'm actually not going to really spend much time on this slide. Um, There's just a couple different examples. Really, that the point here and the thing to consider is when you're thinking about how a project is being framed, um, we want 
less material, less framing material, and more space for insulation. Those are kind of the key properties. So let's dive into that insulation now. So this is cavity insulation. Um, these are just these are four examples of, of, of products that, that we see a lot in the field. Um, again, as I uh, have mentioned about Pass House before, and just to be clear, Passive House does not require any specific material. It doesn't require any specific R value. Um, it doesn't require any specific, you know, say number of inches that that insulation achieves. It's not looking at those details. Um, it's only looking at those final metrics that we showed earlier, those energy performance metrics. Um, you still have to obviously achieve whatever the base code that you're that you have to achieve requires in terms of R value and things like that, but. I simply mean beyond that, passive house does not make any other requirements. Meaning you can do whatever you like and use various materials, use various methods. Um, you're going to, whatever you're using, you're going to plug that into your energy model to help you figure out if, if you're achieving the goals or not. But these are the materials we see in cavity insulation, thermal wool, cellulose, uh, spray foam. I would say the most common ones are fiberglass and cellulose. Um, however, the most common way it's applied is through a dense packing. So that, that first example that you see of somebody putting in fiberglass, putting in very carefully, uh, but generally we don't see fiberglass vats used very often. What would be seen more likely would be blown in fiberglass. In that, that image directly below it, you see somebody blowing in cellulose. Well, you can do the same thing with fiberglass and you can blow in fiberglass. And that's, I would say, is the most common thing I see in past houses, blown in cellulose, blown in fiberglass. When we get into kind of a lot of larger multifamily projects that are going up now, um, mineral wool is becoming more common. So what you see that guy in the right corner doing, the top right corner, putting fiberglass bats in, I do, or sorry, mineral wool bats, I do see that being used more. Um, and then spray foam down at the bottom, I don't see spray foam as often. I'm including it because it still still happens, um, but for a variety of reasons, um, we, we don't see it as often uh, anymore. No matter what method you're using, though, the proper installation of it is critical. So dense packed insulation um, can settle. So it has to be done at the right density, because if it's done at too low of a density, it can settle in that wall and creating gaps. Uh, so measuring the density and making sure the, the correct amount is put in for that, for that cavity space, for the volume of cavity space, is an important part of putting this in. So, for example, insulation. Uh, insulation contractors, this is something they need to know about, have experience in, and know how to put in insulation at the correct density. Um, bats, if you are using bats, especially in the case of mineral wool, because we do see that, they need to be sized correctly, cut correctly uh, for that spaces. Um, any little gaps are not going to be helpful, and spaces where if something's cut a little too big and, and the installer has to kind of compress it a little bit, that compression actually reduces the performance. Sometimes it's counterintuitive. We think if we're, you know, we're packing more insulation in that space uh, because we're compressing it, but um, that that insulation is designed to work at the, you know, at the compression density is at. And if we're compressing it, we're actually weakening it. So making sure that those things are sized correctly matters. Uh, and then things like uh, spray foam, for example, spray foam. One of the reasons we don't see it as often is it requires a little bit more. Um, quality control at the end because it doesn't always expand to the desired thickness we want. It has to be applied at correct temperatures. Um, it requires mixing of different of different um, components that have to be mixed at the right ratios. There's lots of things that can uh, affect how uh, how it expands and it might not expand to the correct uh, density or correct thickness that we want. So these are things you have to pay attention to no matter what installation type you're using. Moving on to exterior insulation. So what we're going to wrap around all of this. These are the common things I see, mineral wool boards, polyiso, wood fiber boards, and some type of EPS or FTS foam. Uh, most of the projects I've shown you and the ones I'm probably going to show you are mineral wool. That's right now, that's just the most common thing I see uh, for exterior insulation. But these other ones are used. Uh, wood fiber is um, probably the one that's, um, that has been the least used in, in this area in New England simply because of availability. There hasn't been a local provider until very, very recently. So all of this had been shipped from um, uh, very few and, and small suppliers in, in Europe. So it wasn't readily available. But I, I imagine we're gonna be seeing this more and more as there is now a local supplier who's, who's come around making this. Um, but it, it works pretty similar to mineral wool in terms of performance. Um, so these are just different products, different things that we see. You can spec again anything. 
But these, these look at these bullet points as, as kind of the ways to think about this. The type of insulation, so whether you're going to use mineral wool or wood fiber or polyiso, that's generally going to be driven by a lot of you know decisions related to cost. Uh, of course, as a lot of these decisions are, uh, but also with familiarity, so how familiar you and your sub product, uh, the project goals as well. Um, things like reducing embodied carbon. Um, embodied carbon is not uh, factored into passive house, it's not built into the modeling, it's not part of the requirements, but it's something that just like net zero is a concept that a lot of people who are building project house or project houses want to achieve as well. They want a lower embodied carbon carbon project. So things like spray foam that are higher in body carbon, they might not use because of those goals. Um, but the main takeaway here is the type of insulation you're using is going to be driven by a lot of these external factors. The amount of insulation that you're using, however, that's going to be determined by your energy model. You're going to plug that data in, you know, the type of material you're using and all the other data that goes into the process, and that's going to help you figure out how much of that insulation you need to use, taking into account all the different heat loads, thermal bridging, and everything else. Um, for example, here at the bottom, you're seeing a project that used three projects that use mineral wool. The same, uh, the same product. Uh, they got it from the same manufacturer, I believe. So they use a very similar thing, uh, but they use different amounts. So they use two inches. We we covered those earlier. On the right, you're seeing Wheaton College. That is a dormitory, a metal frame. They use five inches of mineral wool. So for reasons related to the first bullet point, they all decided on mineral wool. Um, I don't quite know what that was for each of these projects, but th those that top bullet point items led them to pick mineral wool, and then their various modeling projects led them to determine how much they used. And because of different factors with the building, they had to use different amounts. Uh, maybe Finch was a little bit more dense and had more interior heat gain sources. Uh, Wheaton College probably had greater thermal bridging from from the metal framing versus wood framing, so they had to use more, for example, those type of factors. Um, getting into thermal bridging, this is just showing you the impact that exterior insulation has on thermal bridging. So we're this is Finch Cambridge. We are inside one of the one of the units looking at the exterior wall. On the left is simply before the mineral wall was put into place. Uh, the cavity insulation is in here, but the mineral wall is not. Um, and then on the right, you're seeing after the mineral wall was put up. So you're seeing that mineral wall does have a direct impact on thermal bridging through the studs. That's one of the reasons we need to use it. Um, so now I'm going to transition into thermal bridging. So what do we mean when we talk about thermal bridging? I mentioned it a lot, uh, but what it is, is just places in your wall envelope, in your building envelope, where heat can transfer easier than it can through other materials. So certain materials, wood, metal, concrete, um, wood can, or heat can travel easily through these materials compared to insulation, which has a very low thermal conductivity. That's why we use it. So passive house requires a focus on reducing the amount of thermal bridges and then mitigating the impact of the ones that exist. A lot of times you'll feel people, or you're, sorry, you'll hear people talking about past house, even myself, saying we need to eliminate all thermal bridges. And <laughs> that's a lofty goal, but it's not reality. We, we don't actually eliminate every thermal bridge. We can eliminate some, but most of them, we have to figure out ways to mitigate the impact of them. Um, what thermal bridging does, though, why is such a concern, is it leads to heat loss, clearly, it leads to heat transferring through that material and exiting the building. But it can also lead to lower, sur lower surface temperatures on the interior wall. Uh, that can lead to impaired, impaired thermal comfort, risk of condensation, and mold. Um, so a lot of issues around, say, mold in homes, mold on walls, a lot of times we think is directly related to water leaks, which it might be. But many, many times it's because of a thermal bridge through that wall that's creating condensation and, and allowing for mold to, mold to go. Um, so areas of concern, you can see uh, the weak points in insulation, so your studs, um, wall penetration, so anything that goes through the wall has potential to create a thermal bridge. So we want to think about the impact that that's having. Um, beams that are going to meet or pass through a wall, things that are attached to the wall on the outside and have fasteners going through are going to create thermal bridges. <clears throat> and those areas like corners and window frames where we have a lot of uh, non-insulated material, um, it's going to be high thermal bridging as well. So <clears throat> We talked about advanced framing as a way to reduce the number of thermal bridges that you have, um, but what about the ones that you can't get rid of? So you can introduce thermal breaks as kind of one way to do it. This is just showing you an example of a thermal break that helps impact or helps reduce the heat transfer. In this case, you know, through where, where a floor is connecting to a wall, 
Um, this is another example. This is uh, more specific. This is Elm Place. It's a building in Vermont, multifamily wood constructed building on top of a steel platform. And they had parking underneath that platform. So um, on the right, sorry, on the left, you can see how they're kind of specking this. They're going to they're going to insulate the steel beam. They're going to insulate the floor completely. Um, so they're going to do what they can to kind of insulate everything. But that steel beam is going to be a thermal bridge. No matter how well the outside of that beam gets insulated, heat is still going to be able to transfer from the ground through that beam up into the floor. So what's something they do? Highlighted in, in that yellow circle, yellow orange circle, is a thermal break. It's hard to kind of see, but it's a, a lighter gray a square a block that's on top of the steel beam, and that's a thermal break. It doesn't eliminate heat transferring uh, from the vertical steel beam to the horizontal steel beams, but it reduces the impact of it. It lowers the amount of thermal heat that's going to transfer. Um, this is one last example. This is actually a building in, in Connecticut uh, called the Tyler. It was an uh, old, uh, I showed it last week for those that were here. It's that old. Uh, um, school that was converted into um, senior housing. Um, they kept a lot of the, the wall, a lot of the flooring in place, including concrete floors. Um, and what we're seeing here is a way they address thermal bridging. Simply because the floor already existed, this was a retrofit, they couldn't you know, retroactively go in and put in the thermal break. But what they could do is insulate the corners there. And that's what uh, is circled in the orange is there. Start specking how in this case they use spray foam, but they sprayed a, a lot of spray foam there at the corner. And that simply helped reduce the impact that that, uh, that juncture was having on thermal bridging. One last example of thermal bridging that you can't always plan for this is Finch Cambridge. Uh, this came up during uh, actually one of the verification inspections of the project. Uh, so it wasn't something noticed in the design phase, they only noticed it later. But what you're looking at is we're looking up at the, at the top ceiling of the building. Um, and what you're seeing on the far right, so you can see they insulated that whole top area with spray foam. Um, but then sticking through it are these little metal, uh, little, these little metal um, bolts, I think, um, that are coming through that are transferring heat directly through there. And you can see how that's happening, the impact that's having. What these are, are um, I think they were anchor, anchor bolts for some of the solar panels that they have on top of the project. Um, they didn't think about these when they were uh, designing the project, but this impacts them. So they had to go through and spray foam over all those um, afterwards. But it's just an example of where, you know, you might find a thermal bridge late in the process, but you still have to address it. All right. So right now, uh, this is just uh, kind of showing you um, the different concepts of the building envelope layers. Uh, so the four control layers of the project. Right now, we talk about the second one, the heat management barrier or the thermal barrier. Um, there's also the air management barrier, the water management barrier, and the vapor management barrier. Um, the, the example of the wall here is pretty similar to the distillery. Uh, that project I showed you when we were first talking about building envelope that used uh, zip system sheeting and mineral wool. Um, and you can kind of see this is showing you how the different elements of that wall uh, contribute to these different barriers. We focus on heat uh, so far. We focus on cavity insulation, exterior insulation, and the reduction of thermal bridging, which all contributes to the heat management barrier or the thermal barrier. Um, we're going to talk now about the air barrier and dive into kind of how we get that. We'll, we'll address a little bit about water today. And we're not going to get into to vapor really today. That's kind of a larger conversation. I will say that most of the projects that I've showed you are vapor open. So they don't actually have a, a dedicated vapor barrier with the wall. They, they all have some type of vapor control at, at, the, at the floor. Um, around the foundation, but they're not, we're not seeing vapor barriers used in, in the walls. Um, they're vapor open. But now we're going to get into the air lit barrier and we'll talk a little bit about water. So the main principles of the air barrier are to provide a continuous air barrier around the building um, and to eliminate air gaps, holes, penetrations, all those things that we, that, you know, we're air transfers. So we're taping seams, we're taping penetrations, we're finding different ways to to stop all those air leaks. And again, we're measuring this with a board door test. Um, this, I really do want to emphasize how continuous it is. When I talk about thermal insulation, I talk about it being a continuous layer around the outside. Um, but the honest truth is sometimes there's gaps in the continuous insulation uh, that might happen. 
the air barrier, that's not going to happen. This is a continuous air barrier around the building and it's critical that that is continuous and that we make it continuous through things like proper taping of seams. So different materials that you can use, different methods for getting the air barrier. Uh, there's tape sheeting. So you're seeing zip system there in the top left. Um, that's used in a lot of projects. In fact, um, we did a, a study with, with Fias um, maybe a, a year and a half ago or so. There's a, a recording of the session we put on our website, but they look at all the um, certified projects and just kind of uh, what were the common materials. And zip system was the most commonly used um, air barrier material. It wasn't the only one and it wasn't necessarily the most common recently, but it was um, overall the, the most common material. Uh, it provides sheeting. <laughs> Uh, as well as an air barrier, which makes it very easy to install. Uh, it's also a common material that's used on a lot of non pass off projects uh, at this point. So, um, you know, installers are pretty familiar with it. Um, but it, again, just like any air barrier, it requires attention to detail and right application. Um, on the top right, you're seeing a membrane. This is actually a lot of the projects I've shown you, Finch Cambridge, for example, and some of the others are using a membrane. This is becoming, I think, more common than zip at this point in terms of the new projects. Um, but what this is, is this is just a membrane you'll apply over a traditional sheeting material like OSB or, or something else. You'll put a membrane over that. Um, we'll also see uh, fluid applied in some cases. Uh, this is usually more common when you have, you know, some type of uh, masonry, a wall versus um, something else, but you can do liquid applied to air barriers as well that you spray on or kind of uh, apply liquidly. And then vapor, vapor <clears throat> sorry, not be able to talk right now, vaporized sealant, which you're seeing in the bottom right. This is something like aero, aero barrier is kind of a, a name of one of these uh, uh, products, but this is something that's um, aerosol in the inside of the building when it's pressurized and goes and finds sort of all the cracks and, and seals them. I don't see this a lot as the sole air barrier of a project. This is more like a, usually using a backup air barrier. You'll use one of these other systems as sort of your dedicated air barrier. But if you're you know, worried about hitting that blower door test, you have some leaks that you can't find, or especially if you're doing a retrofit, which means you can't address every single area of that wall where you're going to have some gaps in that air barrier, this might be a solution that you use to help, help fill those. There's a quick what's question. Oh, yeah, go ahead, please. Um, re in regards to the air barriers, are fasteners yeah. allowed through it? Oh, good question. <clears throat> yeah. So getting to kind of how we attach these to the wall. So yeah, fasteners are going to be allowed <clears throat> um, to attach these. There's going to be, um, no matter what material you're using, so for example, zip system, that's a sheathing, you're going to, you're going to fasten that to your studs, just like normal. Uh, zip, the membrane, uh, membranes, um, a lot of them are, they, they stick when they're applied. Uh, so you actually just put them on and they're, they're going to stick to whatever material you're using. Um, some membranes might you know, be attached only by, by tape or something, but usually that's not the case. Usually these membranes are going to stick to the, the material you're putting them on. Um, and then when we get into kind of other, other things, maybe we'll talk a little bit about fasteners here as I kind of point out some examples. <clears throat> but we have to use fasteners. Um, the key is we're minimizing the amount that we use to so figure out how to do that, making sure that any, and then on terms of like the, the installation of them, when we're actually, you know, the actual people putting them up, making sure that we're not making mistakes. You know, in a lot of cases, on some projects, you might pound something in and, and realize, or, you know, do, it's just not in the right place and you take it out and now you have a hole there. We don't want those types of things. We don't want those holes. So minimizing errors are, are important as well with factors. Um, so let's get into this. This is looking at the air barrier itself. And this is just called the red line test that you probably all have heard about at this point. The concept is just, can you draw around your whole project? Can you draw the air barrier without lifting up your pencil? It's easy on the left when you're doing the whole building. When you get on the right though, that's when it really becomes a, a factor when you zoom in on a detail. And when we talk about the air barrier and the importance of it being continuous, the details of these transitions are really what matters. So I'm going to spend the next couple of slides kind of highlight this. Uh, but this red line test, you should think of this on your project. You should just do this as an exercise every time you're looking at one of these type of, of drawings and just kind of figure out can you identify the air barrier and can you uh, follow it along. And if you can't, you know, figure out what's what's missing. Uh, so on that idea of the continuous air barrier, 
and Washington Connections. This is a project. This is up in uh, Massachusetts, in Northampton. And I want to thank, I think, Stephen Winter Associates for, for some of these slides here on this project. Uh, but what you're looking at, in this case, they use zip system as their air barrier. Um, this is brown zip system. I, I've been showing green a lot. Uh, the green and brown are just different thicknesses. Uh, the brown is actually a little bit thicker than the, um, the green. Um, it's usually more common to be on roofs than it is on walls, but every once in a while I see it on a wall and, and that's what they're using here. But either way, it's still a dedicated air barrier. They have the tape very well applied at the seams. Um, but what about that bottom area? How are they transitioning the zip system to their other, you know, to their, their floor? How are they going to cover that? And, uh, so I was going to kind of highlight this. this. Oh, these red lines got way off. Um, my apologies. We're not circling the right thing at all. That is um, the zips, the vertical red line is meant to be highlighting the zip system sheathing on the outside. Um, the red horizontal highlighting where that zip system translates into the floor air barrier on the inside of the building. And then the yellow circle, that corner. Um, we're meant to be discussing how do we make that transition adequately. In some cases, we're going to use material that's going to wrap around the zip system and go underneath and go into the floor. Um, you have to think about how that's going to be applied. In a lot of cases, uh, before that zip system goes up, we're going to need to put on that flash material on the bottom and make sure it has enough um, extra so we can wrap it up on, to, on top of the zip. Um, we're also going to maybe apply some sealant there. Um, let me show you this on some better examples here. So this is a, a roof connection here. And this one I like because it is really calling out all of the critical connections and even calling out where the sealant is placed. So in this case, the red material uh, you're seeing is their layer of self adhesive air barrier. So you can think of this like that blue sea membrane I showed you when I showed you all the different types of products. That's basically what they're we call it out here, side membrane. So they're bringing that up the side of the building, putting it on top of their OSB. But then when they get up to that wall where the wall meets the roof, they're actually continuing that, that material. They're wrapping the membrane around and they're carrying it all the way into the inside of the building. And you can see that the blue, they're calling out their, their ceiling. Um, um, probably, oh, sorry, I can't actually read that myself, but they're calling out their ceiling a layer there, their gypsum board. Um, that is going to be their dedicated air barrier on the top, and they're calling, and they're showing you how they're overlapping those materials, so that they're making sure they're continuing that air barrier from the outside all the way into the inside. And then you can see the yellow dots, which are beads of top and sealant, and they're calling out how they're using that. The sealant in this case would be, honestly, a backup. It's there um, to, you know, just be extra, extra careful about the air barrier, and those things, those things matter. So specking out that yeah, sealant's going to be applied there. We're going to apply you know a few different at a few different locations. And we're going to be very very sure that air is not leaking through this little corner here where the roof and wall connect. You're also going to be have to pay very careful attention to penetrations, uh, taping details, all the kind of things. So uh, show you the top right. I'll show you first. This is this is a taping detail. So when I talk about how zip system works as an air barrier when it's installed correctly. Uh, this image is showing you what I, I guess one of the ways I, I mean that. This was not installed correctly and you have a lot of bubbles in that tape and that's a problem. You may not look at that and think it's a problem, but if you're kind of wrap your head around passive house detailing, now that's a problem and that needs to be addressed. And that could happen for a variety of ways. It might have mean that the two uh, sheets of the system that are meeting there um, are not flush with each other, then they once slightly raise, and that's why it's uneven. Well, that's a problem. We want to make sure they're flush. It might also be that the tape itself wasn't rolled on properly, um, and so there were some bubbles just kind of created, air bubbles when it was taped on. We don't want that to happen either. Every uh, product has its own tape that they specify, and they also have their own sort of um, manufacturer uh, requirements for how it's applied. They're usually pressure activated tapes, so usually using some type of roller or something else that they provide to make sure that you're getting adequate pressure on there, uh, it's important. So this is a case where this would this would be redone. Um, on the bottom, you're just seeing a tape uh, air or sorry, tape window, um, kind of how they're taping the window um, uh, edges there. You're seeing some plumbing penetrations going through and how that's being taped and addressed. 
And on the far right, you're seeing, you know, electrical box and that that's being taped. These are all different types of places where you just want to make sure it's being adequately done. Uh, so the, the taping on the zip system probably needs to be redone. The three I'm showing on the bottom uh, look okay. Um, but the key is that they are, there are areas to focus on and make sure they're being done correctly. You should also use recommended products, so not just recommended tapes. There's also incredibly good sealing products that are used for penetration. So whether you're, you know, using mechanical, um, whether we're talking about mechanical systems, plumbing systems, electrical lines going through the wall, um, using various different types of products that are available um, to help provide seals is really critical. So use those products. Um, Ask the manufacturers for recommendations, spec what ones you're using, make sure contractors are familiar with them and how to apply them. And then I'm going to go here. Oh, sorry, I'm going to come back to that one and make sure there's enough room to apply them. This is a, uh, this is, you know, I think uh, something for, for an HVAC equipment, some, some type that had to go up into a, a vertical, vertically going up into a ceiling there. And they wanted, they had this great thing spec, this, this great seal to go around there, but there wasn't enough room to install it properly. They, you know, that the pipe was simply installed too close to the wall. Um, in a traditional project that wasn't using that type of seal, that would have been fine. But in a passive house that was going to use a specific seal, that was not fine. That that pipe needs to be farther away from the wall so it gives adequate space to, to seal it. So those are things that might be a little different in passive house. So I'm going to go back to this one. And this one is getting uh, into se sequencing. So we're taking the, the rough window opening here and what we're showing you is that the bottom tape, um, we want that to actually go underneath the air barrier, in this case, the seal material that's going up. That's how that sort of design, you can think of that as sort of shingling style, uh, where the, the top one is over the, the bottom one. And that meant that when that seal material was applied, a section of it um, could, not, could not be sealed. You had to leave it loose so that when um, the tape that applied at the bottom there for the, the window seal uh, and the, um, it, the, the zip could be could be put over it. So just thinking through sequencing, property layering of materials. Um, this is one of the, when we get into lessons learned, this is one of the key things and why there needs to be a lot of communication uh, between team members um, and thinking through, you know, designers need to think through how the contractors are going to apply this stuff in the field. Uh, contractors need to work with subs on their sequencing and when they're there to think through um, how different <laughs> different people are impacting uh, somebody else's work who might come in later, what they need to do differently about it. So all these things uh, contribute to the success of the air barrier. I mentioned that 0.6 ACA 50 goal. In order to achieve it, in order to measure it, we're doing an air tightness test on site. Um, however, we recommend that you do more than one. You don't just do the one at the end to say, yes, we hit the air tightness metric. Um, you want to do some before that. The minimum recommendation, I, I want to clarify, recommendation, not requirement. You can do just one final blower door test and, and that can be okay. But the recommendation is to do it multiple times, at least three. To do one test, uh, once you have windows and doors installed, so once you have a full envelope there, um, ideally after your mechanicals are installed and sealed off, um, then do one after you have sheet rock up, and you can also test individual apartments at that time, and then your full whole building test. Testing it early allows you to identify problems earlier on and allows you to solve them uh, easier. Um, I've now seen projects do blow door tests four or five times. Um, it's becoming more and more common to do one before windows and doors are even installed. Um, you'll put up temporary uh, air barrier at temporary windows or temporary doors, you know, seal those pen seal those open seal those rough openings to do test, um, but it allows you to really narrow in on where you have problems and address them early. So tips, um, isolate the trouble zones. So what that means is while for the final test, you're gonna run a whole building air test, for these earlier tests, you can test certain areas if you want to. Um, there was one project Harvard did where you know uh, area for them was with the lobby. This was multi-fan lobby was a trouble area for them. So they just did a you know blow door test, isolate the lobby and run a test on that. Um, use smoke testing to follow the leak. So you can pressurize the building, use a smoke gun um, in there and follow where that smoke goes. It helps you figure out where the air leaks are. Um, and then have the contractor there for the test. The tests are generally going to be done by maybe your, your uh, verifier or another contractor, but have your, your GC there, have relevant subs there that have, you know, done different 
installed different parts of the air barrier, the person who installed your air membrane, have them there. The people who are taping off your, your plumbing penetrations, have them there. You, you know, have folks there so they can not only see what's happening, but they can learn from it and learn why yeah, it's so important to do things correctly. Nothing shows them something more correctly than seeing <laughs> seeing an uh, air test fail and then seeing that smoke uh, go out of one of the holes in the place that they were responsible for. Nothing drives home the point of, of doing this correctly than that. Here's an example. This is Harbor Village. So on the right, you're seeing their very first midpoint test, and you can see this was done uh, before windows and doors were installed. So here they are, you know, putting up temporary uh, barriers on them so they could run a, an air test. Um, but you're seeing things that they identified, little leaks that they didn't notice, uh, but they, they, their, their blower door test was not at the number they wanted. So they walked around, they looked at different things, and they saw little places that they could address. Later on in construction, these things would have been covered up, and they would have had a much harder time addressing them if they were able to address them at all. So this is one of the reasons to do blower door tests early. So when you do come across issues like this, um, you still have time to address it. Uh, so, in a lot of ways, it seems like this adds time and it adds cost and complexity, uh, but the reality is it's saving you a time fixing errors later, and it's generally saving you costs and it's helping you achieve your, your end goal. So, that's air tightness testing. We've gone through the thermal area and the air barrier area. I do want to spend just a couple of slides talking about water control. Um, so, generally, these buildings are using some type of rain screen that's creating a gap between your um, whatever the, the outside area is, your uh, uh, wall membrane or your insulation, and then your siding. And that gap is a place where air can flow. So this, this slide is kind of showing you a little bit about it. But in general, when you think about water, water needs a place to, to follow, needs a path to follow. And we also need a plan for when that path fails and where water gets where we don't want it to. So generally, you know, our siding, our shingles, our gutters, these our flashing materials, these are the types of things that keep bulk water out. But we also know bulk water is going to get in. And when it does, we want to provide a way. So those rain screens, those rain gaps provide that. Um, rain, bulk water that gets in can drain downwards and then go out to a little weak at the bottom. And then vaporized water can rise up with air and then go out a little, uh, a little gap at the top. And that's what a rain screen does. It provides that way for air, whether it's, you know, bulk water or vaporized air to move, or sorry, vaporized water to, to move in and out of there. So there's often materials we can use, drainage mats, uh, vertical uh, or horizontal battens. We see that a lot. And for a lot of these larger projects, we're starting to see different dedicated uh, systems. So Finch Cambridge used something called Cascadia Clips. The Loop used something called a night wall system. These things help you attach your siding uh, and create that gap. At the same time, uh, these these things are also helping you reduce the penetrations to the wall. That question that came up earlier about fast, uh, fasteners, one of the key places where we want to reduce the fasteners is through siding going all the way through the project. So these types of systems help reduce the amount of fasteners that we need to attach that siding at the end. There's lots of different things out there now. These these two things are just two examples, but they're just helping us do that. So. Back to the built building envelope layer, we covered air, we covered heat, we covered a little bit of water. Again, we haven't talked too much about vapor, but again, these projects are, are that I've shown you are for the most part vapor open. Um, and when they're vapor open, all we're really doing is allowing a, a way for that vapor to move. Um, so that rain screen works as our vapor control layer because that's where it allows vapor to, to move out of the wall. So we've kind of addressed all these layers. When you're thinking about a project, or sorry, thinking about your project, I like kind of this slide or these concepts of the four control layers. So it's just good to always come back to them and think about like how does my building envelope address these four four areas. So now we're going to get into mechanical systems, and we have about it looks like twenty minutes left. So again, ask questions, and Anna, if there's any more relevant ones, definitely jump in now. But I'm going to leave time at the end for them some more. But we're going to get into our uh, balance and continuous ventilation systems and our efficient and minimized heating and cooling systems. We are not going to talk about water heating today, other than to say efficient water heating and efficient distribution uh, is important in these projects. Um, but the heating, cooling, and ventilation are going to be the ones that we focus on today. So energy recovery ventilators, these this is how we're providing efficient ventilation. These are the lungs of the building. 
They're continuously running ventilation systems, so they're on all the time, cycled. Uh, they can have variable fan speeds, so they can go on and or sort of, they can run at lower or higher fan speeds, but they're going to be on all the time. Um, they're providing fresh filtered air into the building. And something that's not written on here, but it was uh, really uh, critical about these is that they're, uh, they're, they're balanced systems. So they're designed so that the exact same volume of air that's being exhausted out of the building is the same volume of air that's being put into the building. So they're, they're, they're equally balanced systems. And that's another key aspect of these. Um, but for those who are kind of new to ERVs, you can see the image down here of how they work. Um, but this is, you know, this is a uh, winter. Um, we have, uh, sorry, this is, let me look at this. This is let's look at that size, stale air from inside. Okay, yeah, so this is, so the stale air is, is your blue, so it's pulling air in. If we have a winter day and your air inside might be in a minute, you have it set at 68 degrees. So air, 68 degree air is being pulled from the inside, your exhaust air is passing through this heat exchanger core in the middle of the ERV. This heat exchanger core extracts some of the heat energy from that outgoing air. So from that 68 you know, degree air that we're pulling out, we're able to extract some heat energy. Um, different ERVs are gonna have different heat efficiency ratings. Um, you'll see all kinds of them, maybe 60%, 70% heat efficiency rating. Generally, the ones used in the past our projects are gonna be a minimum of 80% heat recovery rating. So you're gonna have a heat recovery efficiency rating of 80% or higher. I mean, they're gonna recover 80% of that heat energy, which is quite a bit. Um, and then the air that's being pulled from outside, so that air that's outside, that might be uh, 40 degrees, is being pulled inside. And it's also passing through this heat exchanger core where it's getting some of that energy, effectively being preheated without having to mix it with any of the, ex uh, any of the exhaust air or use any type of actual mechanical heating system to, to heat it up. It's just using this heat exchanger. Um, at the same time, this is be, this air is being passed through filters, and these filters are clean air. So when we talk about high-level indoor air quality, this is one of the key ways in which we're delivering that. So we're taking all of the dirty air from the inside, the stale air that might have high levels of CO2 from us breathing out or might have other contaminants in it, and we're pulling it out. And then we're taking all that air from the outside, and we're filtering out the particulate matter and the other contaminants that are in it before we pump it inside the house. And just as kind of a quick note, I've been saying ERV and then HRV. Uh, ERV is energy recovery ventilators. HRV is heat recovery ventilators. These two things work exactly the, the same. Um, just the heat exchanger core is a little bit different on them. The one that's used in an ERV is better de at dealing with uh, latent heat or with uh, or humidity, effectively with humidity. So in, in our climate zone here in New England, uh, we generally want ERVs uh, rather than HRVs. So that's what we usually see here. Um, these are the air source heat pumps. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the sizing and the location of those systems in, in one moment. But I do want to introduce the, the heating and cooling system first. And this is air source heat pumps, different VRF systems. These are all electric. They provide heating and cooling, and they're incredibly efficient, two to four times as efficient as sort of your um, most efficient <laughs> uh, gas systems. Uh, they can be ducted, unducted, uh, and there's plenty of, of low climate, or sorry, cold climate uh, ones now as well. I mean, if you are familiar with old ones or kind of that old data, you'll, you'll know they didn't work too well in our climate zone, but that's that's the thing in the past. They work well. Um, I want to move on to this slide a little bit about, uh, oh, sorry, let's see, we have it here. No, I don't. So I'll just, oh, here we go, VRF. So VRF is, these effectively work the exact same way, uh, but they're just uh, um, used in larger projects. They're all electric, they provide heating and cooling, kind of the same thing. In both cases where we're looking at a VRF or kind of traditional heat pump system, we have a compressor uh, that's on the outside of the building, uh, and we have different interior um, 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 elements uh, that are on the inside. Um, and we're simply transferring coolant between them. So we're not necessarily pushing air from the compressor on the outside to the inside, where we're using coolant and we're transferring that around, uh, and the coolant is being used to uh, heat or cool the air. So <clears throat> those are the systems themselves, and I did kind of rush through the descriptions of them a little bit. We spent more time on it last week, and uh, for those of you who are, are new this week, you might have an already kind of knowledge of the system. So I want to spend more time on how we think about sizing and, and locating these systems, because that's kind of the more critical decision. We know in most projects, we're going to use some type of heat pump or VRF system. We're going to use an ERV. 
let's talk about the, the differences in, from project to project. One of those differences is centralized versus decentralized. So I'm giving you two examples. This is Finch Cambridge on the top, but a distillery on the bottom, both multifamily projects. On the top, they use a VRF system. So they have condensers on the roof. Those were connected to heat pump heads in each unit. So when I say connected, I mean they have coolant lines connecting them um, to each unit. And they had around 13 rooftop condensers that supplied all of their indoor units, around 149 indoor units. This is what we considered a centralized system, meaning all the condensers were centralized and they went, in, went to heat multiple units. The distillery used what we consider individual, uh, individual system. Every unit of this building had their own dedicated heat pump system. So there was one compressor on the roof for every residential unit of the building. And that compressor had their condenser lines that went into their dedicated heat pump system in their apartment. Uh, so one heat pump had per unit. Um, so those are two different methods of doing this. Um, when we look at, so I'm, I'll talk about the plus and minuses in a moment, but when we talk about ERVs, it's kind of the same difference. Are we talking about centralized or unitized? The distillery, um, they also did a, a unitized or localized system for ERVs. So every apartment unit of that building had their own ERV in it. In fact, everyone had a little closet door that you could open up and there was an ERV unit. Um, for their for this specific unit. If we go all the way to the right, Finch Cambridge, um, just like they did with their um, uh, VRF system, they had a centralized approach. They had their ERVs located up on the roof that were then ducted down into each of the units in the building. So they had this shared or centralized uh, ventilation system. And then we had a kind of a hybrid approach, which we see sometimes on Manhattan Station in uh, Manhattan right in Boston used this one, where they kind of had a hybrid approach where they had ERVs on each floor um, that then went to multiple units on that floor. Um, so it was sort of a still a shared system, uh, but only floor by floor. <clears throat> so you can kind of see already from this image, what are the differences? Uh, when we have a, something like the distillery, you don't have any of the expansive duct network going through the building. You don't need it. It saves space. It reduces um, maybe some challenging, you know, construction issues around the, 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 the um, you know, um, around uh, heat transfer through the, the ducts. So you eliminate that. But you are also increasing the amount of penetrations on the outside of the envelope. Every one of these ERVs has a supply line and an exhaust line that needs to go outside the building. So in the the distillery, every apartment, that ERV was up against the wall and had an exhaust line going outside and a supply line going outside. Those are increased penetrations, increased places where you can have air tightness issues and thermal abrasion issues. The centralized approach with Finch meant they didn't have any of those exhaust or supply penetrations on the side of the building. They only had one, you know, larger penetration at the top where everything came, came up. Um, so that was kind of, you know, in some ways, that was a plus. But they also had a very large duct network going through the building, both vertically and horizontally. Um, Mattapan reduced the vertical air ducts. They only had, they only needed the horizontal ones going through floor by floor, and they reduced the amount of penetrations going to the outside. But they still had some. Every floor had, you know, exhaust and supply penetrations. So these are kind of the trade-offs with this approach. At this point in time, I see, I see all of these things being used in projects. There has not been any consensus on which one of these is better. So don't go into this thinking one of these is better than the other. The proper way to think about this is to work with your MEP consultant and say, which are we going to use? And then figure out how you're going <laughs> to design and construct your project to do that correctly. Uh, but each of these can be used, but you want to know early on which one your project is going to use, because it matters and it impacts everything else. Um, and one other impact that it has is on roof space. This is a project that used um, the, the, high, the areas on that roof that are highlighted in yellow are their mechanical areas. That's where they had ERVs and VRF systems. <clears throat> um, so they had to take up roof space and they had a plan for that, where that roof space would go. Um, sometimes you're going to have that roof space, it's no problem. Other times you might have another goal. For example, you want to be a net zero building and you need to use a lot of roof space for solar. The more roof space you use for mechanical equipment, the less space you have for solar production. So those are some trade-offs there as well. On the left, you're seeing the, these are examples of wall penetrations. Uh, these are just places where now you have those penetrations. This is showing you the supply and exhaust lines from ERVs that are being sucked right through that wall envelope. 
again, creating thermal bracing and air tightness. So all of these different things, they have trade-offs. Um, you need to figure out early on with your NET consultant which one you're going to use. Um, you know, or you don't need to use any of these. <laughs> uh, the last example here of a mechanical system is one where we don't don't have one uh, for heating or cooling. Yes. Sorry, for heating and cooling, we have a ventilation. But for heating and cooling, Rocky Mountain Institute out in Colorado, uh, very cold, cold climate has no central heating and cooling system. They rely on solar heat gain, thermal mass, and interior heat sources, uh, people, equipment uh, to produce heat. And their wall envelope uh, was designed well enough and tight enough to keep all that in. And they didn't need to use any heating or cooling system. They didn't have a ventilation system though. But so maybe maybe that going back to what I said, passive houses are not passive. Well, maybe, maybe you can get them a little bit closer to being completely passive for heating and cooling. Lessons learned. I got three final slides here on design phase lessons learned, construction phase, and then uh, some project management lessons learned. Um, I think we're going to be able to get these slides out to you. I was talking with Anna before this. Uh, I'll get her some copies and, and so you can have these for reference. Uh, they'll be posted somewhere uh, so you can read through this. So I won't read through all of them. I'm just going to highlight some of the ones that I find very, very critical. So number one, integrated team. Bring together your team early. Figure this out. Uh, take advantage of that feasibility study incentive that Anna mentioned at the very beginning. If you're, you know, if you're doing a multifamily project that qualifies, do that. Um, get these folks involved. Get your rater, your verifier, your certifier. Uh, get people involved early. Pay attention to your critical barriers. So the ones I mentioned, air, thermal, water, vapor. Pay attention to them and communicate them. Highlight them on your drawings. Talk about them with consultants. Talk about them with contractors. Make sure your contractors talking about them with subcontractors. They need to be clear. Um, construction phase, hold kickoff meetings on site with associated trades. This is very helpful to make sure people are on the same page. We all know, you know, every day, every week on a, on a construction site, there's gonna be different people there, different subs coming in. Have an opportunity to do a do a kickoff meeting with them when they're when they're new to the project to so kind of tell them about the the differences with passive house and not every single sub is going to need to know every concept of passive house but they are going to need to know some things about hey how they're impacting the air barrier or something else about what they're doing uh, so make sure you have some type of way to to remind them of that to teach them about that uh, use mock-ups that's a key way to kind of drive this home on site you can actually have something that people can see uh, touch uh, practice on even. Um, invite manufacturer reps. They're they're helpful to explain how things can be done correctly, or show you the proper amount of pressure to apply to a tape, for example. Um, the other ones, air barrier, blow door test. I've kind of mentioned. Uh, in terms of project management, communication is key. I think I've kind of hit on this a lot as well throughout throughout this. It's been kind of a common theme, but communicate the details um, in, in all kinds of various ways, from having meetings with multiple different project team members to communicating with folks through drawings, through using color to highlight different barriers. Um, you're seeing in one of these photos here, you're seeing a sign. This is an air barrier sign that's posted all over the project. This was everywhere on the project. Um, just reminding people the air barrier is important. Do not puncture the air barrier. Um, it matters. And if you do, fix it. <laughs> Um, plan for multiple blower door tests. I mentioned that, but make sure you plan for it. So have it in your schedule. Uh, figure out how you're going to do walkthroughs um, for the blower door test and identify some of those air leaks early. Figure out who's going to be there for those tests. What contractor are you going to have? What subs are you going to have there? Um, assign responsibility for the air barriers to the people. I've seen certain roles being given out, like air, air barriers or captains almost, where uh, there are folks who can kind of, as you know, the days go by and weeks go by, they can kind of walk through that site and, and examine these things and, and see where maybe uh, the plumber came in and didn't quite seal something right and they can talk to them about it and make sure it's done right. And they kind of know they're, they're responsible for that. These things are important. Communicating it is key. So I think uh, we're going to end there. We got about five minutes for questions, though I will stick around if we have a lot of them. Uh, thank you guys all for attending this. Passive House, there's a lot to talk about, a lot of things we can go over. So I hope that today, for those of you that joined us for, for last week as well, I hope these sessions have been, been helpful for you. Um, we have a lot more resources on our website, uh, Connecticut Passive House's resources on theirs as well. And of course, Anna told you at the beginning about all the great uh, training through, through MassSave. Take advantage of all of these things to learn more, but please let me know the questions that you have right now.
Yes, there are some. Okay. okay, first one is if an owner of a single unit in a multifamily building wants to look at passive house certification, can the unit be evaluated or would they need to get the entire multifamily building evaluated? Yeah, it's going to be the entire building. So it's not going to be uh, an apartment unit by apartment unit or condo unit by a condo unit. There's going to be the, the whole building. Um, I would say, yeah, it's going to be the whole building. There, there might be some except, you know, when you get into like row houses or something where they're separate buildings, but they share like a, the walls meet and they kind of share a wall. There are ways to do that because um, they're technically separate buildings, but a multifamily building, the whole thing is going to be certified. Okay. Uh, one more here on mineral wool. Is it true that there has been a supply issue with mineral wool? Um, I, so I haven't heard from that. I can't, I can't say because I, I haven't heard that from folks, but I could easily not be, not be somebody they're telling. So I, I don't know. I would say if there is a supply issue that we're seeing, you know, over the last several years, there's been supply issues for a lot of things, um, but we're seeing um, more alternatives becoming available. I think uh, here in New England, we now have a local supplier of wood fiber, which is a uh, you know, pretty similar product to mineral wool. It's, it's, it does have its differences, it's wood and not, not mineral, but uh, it's a similar product, so you can start sourcing that as an alternative if you're having trouble getting mineral wool. Um, but I, I don't know about sourcing issues, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, one other question. Someone says they're having difficulty finding and identifying third party verifiers for single family residential yeah. in Connecticut. Okay. Yeah, that, that might be the case. I mean, the more and more of these projects that are going up, the greater demand is being put on these various roles. I know we, we just did a radar training up here in Massachusetts not too long ago, trying to get more folks and have FIASs on it. So if you're working on a FIAS project, for a single family home, the person you're going to bring on is a, a FIA certified rater. Um, rater and verifier are two terms that get thrown around very uh, a lot. I, I do the same thing, but generally speaking, FIA says a rater works on smaller projects like single family projects or or maybe you know your, your townhouse style small projects. And then a verifier is going to work on your larger projects. So if you're doing a single family project, you're looking for a FIA rater. Um, you do need them, so I, I'm sorry if you can't find one, but you can get one from out of state. You can get one from anywhere. FIAS radars can work anywhere. Um, they will come on site a little bit, but they can travel. Uh, FIAS, their, their website has a good kind of search feature where you can kind of see people who are certified. Um, on our website, we also have a search feature for, feature for our members. Uh, so you can go on there. You don't have to be a member to search, but our members are listed, but you can use that to search and you can filter by radars, so you can kind of find a few there. Um, those were kind of some ways to do it, but you are going to need to bring one on. Great, thank you. Uh, another question that came in, does the energy model identify the condensation point within the wall cavity? This has been an issue on conventional projects. Yeah, so this gets a little bit into, you know, a little bit more of that vapor movement kind of thing of how we're trying to get, you know, avoid condensation, avoid the, dew, you know, having our dew point there. Uh, the energy model does not, um, the Wufi or PHP is not going to go into, I don't think it's going to highlight the, like, where that dew point will be in the wall and where you're going to have condensation hit. There's other ways you can do that, other other softwares I think you can bring in. Um, not necessarily, no. And that's, this is one, I know, this comes up a lot. We actually just had a building science discussion last week, or this, or no, last month, where this came up quite a bit. Um, no. So how are you going to really assure that happens? So one way is through a lot of these buildings. When you build these projects, you're looking at our, our vapor open. So we're hoping that condensation is not actually occurring in that envelope at all. It's going to the outside and then venting out through that rain screen. And you're not really getting condensation in the inside of it at all. But um, yeah. Right, that's not a good okay. answer, but that's the <laughs> best answer I can give at this current moment without diving into a lot yeah. more uh, building science discussions on on that sort of dew point vapor movement and so on. That's a whole session in itself. Maybe that should be the next one we do. Right. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Well, it is 1.30, so okay. I think okay. we awesome. should 
call it an end. Yeah, and there are no additional questions coming in. So yeah, thanks Aaron again for this great 201. And thanks everyone for joining. And thank you to the sponsors of Energize Connecticut who makes these trainings possible. Um, yeah, so have a good rest of the day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.